right, let's get rocking, let's get rolling. Make sure you have your notes. If you didn't pick up your notes, we've got water, we've got some snacks over there. Thanks everybody for being here on time. And we are going to have a whirlwind tour through the book of Revelation tonight. You've had it very easy. We've just gone a couple chapters at a time. Now we've got six chapters, parts of six chapters to take a look at tonight, but all under the, the same theme, uh, really, of, of getting, uh, getting us acclimated to the judgments uh, that God is going to be bringing. So, uh, yeah, make sure you have your notes. Uh, there's little tabs in there if you want to separate your notes. The tabs are in the containers. You might like to utilize that uh, sometime. Esty Gordon was a prolific evangelical writer back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I love this prayer quote. The greatest thing anyone can do for God and man is pray. It is not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. The great people of the earth today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, not those who can explain about prayer, but I mean those people who take time and pray. Join me as we begin tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you've given us, and we thank you for the time to gather together and to have your word open before us and to speak into our lives. So we are very grateful. Thank you for the week since we met last and for your working in and through our lives and families and friends, Lord. We are grateful. Uh, we know that uh, in a group like this, there's uh, many needs that are represented. Maybe uh, some folks need a healing touch or have a, a family member or friend who needs that touch, Lord. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're the great physician. And we do ask that you would put your healing touch on physically or emotionally, relationally, mentally, or spiritually. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for calling us to know Christ, gifting us with the Spirit of God. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and teach us through the word that you inspired the Apostle John to write and have given to us and help us to gain the best understanding we can of it and to see how we may apply it to our life that we would bring honor and glory to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Well, a quick review, uh, weeks one, two, and three. Christ's grace to the church, capital C Church. First week, we were looking at chapter one, and we saw that Jesus loves his church. He is... He has ordained his church to accomplish his purpose. We are Jesus' plan A, and there is no plan B for reaching the world. It is through his church and his people, and he is purifying it. As we saw specifically in chapters 2 and 3, the critique of those churches that uh, were falling short of what Christ had wanted. And that's week 2, chapters 2 and 3, Christ's grace to the churches, plural, the seven churches. And there were many things we saw, but there was a common thread of remembering, remembering where you've been and return to that repent of sin that you may be doing, whether it's false teaching or immorality or idolatry or hard-heartedness or coldness. Uh, repent of that and turn back to the one who is there uh, beckoning you to come and have a deep relationship with him. And then uh, just that little interlude there, right there, chapters 4 and 5 serve as a transition. Uh, 4 and 5 lead on to all the rest of the 22 chapters, and uh, really we're looking at what Jesus said in chapter 1, write the things that you see. And John saw those things, Jesus standing amongst the lampstands with the seven stars in his hand representing the church, and he wrote those, what things you see, what things are, the seven churches were in existence right then, chapters 2 and 3, and what things are to be, and that's chapters 4 to 22, but chapters 4 and 5 that we saw last week, just that interlude up in heaven, John gets a glimpse of it, and so when we saw that, we, we walked away with four applications. When we see the spectacular view of heaven, and God on the throne, Jesus, the slain lamb, 
uh, taking the scroll, the five doxologies that are portrayed in those two chapters, starting with the four living creatures and then those four living creatures with uh, the 24 elders and then those 28 with harps and then joined by angels and then finally all of those plus every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, all proclaiming uh, quite a majestic scene. So we, we walked away with thinking we need to have the worship of him. Certainly when we see those two chapters, it reminds us that this is a prelude for eternity. We're going to be worshiping in eternity. And this is in our opportunity now to begin that process of truly worshiping and then trust in him. God is sovereign. He's in control. Uh, we need to trust him for our lives. We need to trust him for the lives of those we love, those that we minister to. Uh, obedience to him. Uh, the angels, the elders, the, the living creatures were all in obedience to the Father and the Lord Jesus in that setting. And we need to obey as well. Trust and obey, for there is what? No other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And finally, service for him. The angels, the elders, they were, be they were at Jesus and the Father's beck and call to serve him, to accomplish his purpose. So those were some things we walked away with. So that, with that in mind, uh, just take a few minutes at your table and a couple quick questions. One basically from the review, what was one truth or point of emphasis that has stood out to you from weeks one to three? As we've gone through them, uh, any particular thing, a truth or an application that's jumped out to you? And then part of our assignment was to look at some verses that really are the basis for the Hallelujah Course and Handel's Messiah. And if you had a chance to watch the, the video clip of the London uh, Orchestra and Choir singing the Hallelujah Chorus or maybe another rendition of it. Uh, does it bring back any memory of a time when you've really been moved by the Hallelujah Chorus at a service or at a, a production of it? So take a few minutes at your tables, talk about either one of those, and then we'll get rolling, okay? All right, if you have your notebooks, open your notebooks up. Week four, a great quote here. This is from the Chronological Study Bible. I'll, I'll advance it. That's what it looks like here. It's a great tool, and you can really see how things lay out on a chronological, both Old Testament and New Testament. It's pretty cool. Uh, I've had this now for 13 years. It's very special, and I, do, I, I just share this. It was given to me when I started at the GP 13 and a half years ago, and there were five men on the search committee and kind of were a part of that. Dave Smisher, uh, the late Jim Isham, uh, and Barry Chatham, Roger Hall, and uh, Rich Westlake. So I, it, having that inscribed by them, it's always it's very special. But anyway... Uh, it, they said this, throughout history, apocalyptic literature, remember we've said this is apocalyptic literature uh, in a sense that it's got angels, it's got visions, it's got numbers, it's God conquering evil, uh, things were a part of it, but it's not like typical apocalyptic where there's a, a pseudo writer and it's trying to accomplish certain things. This is scripture and it's mostly prophetic written in an apocalyptic manner. Throughout history, Apocalyptic literature has been most popular when current conditions have turned chaotic. We, anybody experience that at all? Uh, <laughs> at such times, there's been a tendency to find remarkable similarities between one's own situation and the biblical prophecies. I love this line. This tendency should be resisted. Biblical prophecy was not given in order that we might create a timetable for future events. Rather, its authors intended to stimulate obedience to and confidence in God, who remained firmly in control of both contemporary events and the future. And I think that it just sums it up so well. So as I scroll through there, 
I remember it was 1973, and a coach talked to me about the late great planet Earth, and God used that as, as one of the means of really drawing me into a personal faith in Jesus Christ. If you remember, Hal Lindsey's book came out in 1970. What was going on there that kind of matches up with this quote? Well, we had the 60s and all the things going on in the 60s, the Vietnam uh, War, the campus unrest, uh, civil rights movement. So you start looking and say, okay, are these signs that we're seeing from the book of Revelation? Well, of course, uh, in his book, he said, well, the 10 toes represent the 10 nation common market of Europe. Well, of course, that has uh, since been dissolved and we have the uh, European Union and it's far more than 10 countries. So we see that that really, you know, you can't go out on a limb and start saying categorically this, this, and this. Uh, and then we had uh, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, uh, the Left Behind series with Tim LaHaye. And what was going on there? Well, we had the Oklahoma City bombing. We had the, 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 the mass murder in Tokyo and the rail stations there, the Balkan problem, problems. We had the bombing of the embassies in Tanzania and Kenya. And of course, the World Trade Center, several different bombings, uh, including the one in 2001. And so we started looking and saying, okay, how is this biblically uh, coming into be? And we could look at the same thing. How, where does the pandemic, where does COVID fit into this? Where does a conflict with Russia and the Ukraine, tension with China, uh, nuclear armaments with Iran and North Korea and uh, problems with Pakistan and India, you know, how does this, can we start piecing this together? And I think that quote just reminds us it, we, the tendency to do so should be avoided. And let's look and see what the Lord is saying to us from his word and try to move forward on it. And I think uh, just a, a reminder, and, and this has really helped me, current events in a, are a preview, are a preview of the tribulation time. The tribulation time, uh, the final seven years, using a historic, literal, grammatical hermeneutic of looking at scripture, it's the last seven years uh, prior to the Lord's return, the tribulation time. Uh, in the prophecy, there were, there were going to be 490 uh, years, uh, weeks of years that Daniel prophesied, and Messiah was cut off at, after 483. There was, there's still a seven-year, a week of years left, and that's where we believe the, the tribulation is coming. And so the current events are a preview of the tribulation, but the tribulation, as we'll see tonight, is a preview of what the lake of fire, of what eternal hell is going to be like. It's only a preview. It's nowhere near the final uh, awfulness of what that lake of fire and hell is, but it is a preview of it. So chapter 6, and we're going to look at the seven seal. Jesus has taken the scroll at the end of chapter 5, and he's now going to begin to open that. And we're going to see the first seven set of judgments, the seven seal judgments that will lead to the seven trumpet judgments that will lead to the seven bowl judgments. Most likely the seven trumpet uh, seal judgments are happening over the first three and a half, four, maybe to five year period of the tribulation. Somewhere in there is the abomination of desolation where the Antichrist goes into the temple, desecrates it probably at the midway point, three and a half years, and the, and the seal judgments seem to go beyond that a little bit. The trumpet judgments then from year five, six, and really up close to the time the Lord's coming, and then the bold judgments, rapid fire, boom, right in the last days, weeks before the Lord returns. So that's kind of a helpful way of thinking about that. Verse one, now I, John, watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, so he's trying to describe it using that simile, come. So this, this first seal is calling forth someone. And I looked and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow, no arrows though, and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. Uh, it seems like this is... The, uh, the, 
the Antichrist coming, bringing, seeking to bring peace. He has no arrows. He's trying to bring peace to the world. He's on a white horse signifying a conqueror. He is summoned and uh, he was given authority. It's interesting. He was given, he's he, given authority and certainly under the sovereign hand of God. Uh, turn, if you would, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We won't have a time for a lot of cross-references. You have many in your notes there. But chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3 Paul's writing, he says, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains from upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So there's going to be a period of time, peace and safety, but it is not going to be a true peace. And the Antichrist is coming, and he's trying to bring this all together. Go to Matthew 24, and then just kind of keep your finger there, put a little uh, note because we're going to come back to Matthew 24 a lot. This is Jesus' Olivet Discourse, Matthew's version of it. And Matthew, in chapter 24, verse 5, uh, he says, For many, so Jesus is saying this uh, 30 A.D., John's writing this 95 A.D., so this is 65 years previous. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. And you, so there's that, that whole emphasis there. Verse 11 says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that's the Antichrist going into the temple, desecrating it, at the midway point, standing in the holy place, and Matthew puts a parenthesis, let the reader understand that those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. We'll see more of that next week. And then finally, verse 23. So just how consistent Jesus is in spelling out what's going to be happening and what John's seeing. Then if anyone says to you, look here, there, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. It's not possible. If we're elect, called by God, sealed by the Spirit of God, it is not possible that we're going to lose our salvation and be deceived. But it's going to come close. The deception is going to be so strong. So here we see that, and, and I was trying to think, okay, what is, you know, what... The mindset, and I, I go back to 1938. I wasn't there for the time. Uh, I've been around, but I haven't been quite around that. Uh, but um, uh, Chamberlain was the prime minister of Britain, and he went to meet Hitler uh, when Hitler was uh, saber rattling and starting to uh, look to take the Sudetenland, and he was, he was making plans for European conquest. And Chamberlain said, you know, he came back from that meeting saying, what, peace for our time. Well, that peace was short-lived because Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia and Poland and, and really began the war. So the, this Antichrist is going to come. He's going to say, peace in our time. And he's going to uh, gather people around him who want peace. People who want peace. They're, they're, and they're going to be tired of conflict. And they're going to want somebody who can try to unify the world. Verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, again being beckoned, and out came another horse, bright red, and its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So the second seal, the rider comes, and this is the red horse signifying death. So even though the Antichrist is coming trying to bring peace, there is uh, conflict going on. And we, we see that in our day today. These are active conflicts, and we don't even have Ukraine. I, I copied this weeks ago, so we don't even have Ukraine in there. But we see that, and since the Trojan War, there have been 137 full-scale wars that have taken place as someone tried to, to count them. So we've, we've got, we're dealing with that. The red horse comes signifying the 
conflicts that are still going on. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked and behold a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. You're saying, what in the world is that? Well, this is signifying most likely a, a famine, starvation. Uh, there's uh, problems economically. Uh, a denarius is a day's wage. So you could get wheat for one person for a day. Or you can get barley, which was horse feed, and it could feed three people. That's not really what you wanted, but it could feed three people. Do not harm the oil and wine. Different interpretations of that. The one I like is the fact that there's still people are going to still need to eat. And they used oil and wine for cooking and preparing food. They're not total starvation. It's not everything taken away, but yet there's going to be difficulties. And when you think about the world, we know pictures like this, but you know, just pick your abject poverty, starvation, famine uh, that's taken place. And, and during the two years of COVID, uh, there has been quite a bit of, of uh, famine in different parts of the world. And we see tragic pictures like this. So the third horse of the, the four of the apocalypse, as uh, commonly known, has come forth. And finally, the fourth one, verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, so the battles are still going on, and with famine, and with pestilence, experience that, and by wild beasts of the earth. So, I mean, nature is creating havoc here. It's a... Uh, the, the word pale in Greek is chloros, and we get what, chlorine, that, a chlorine gas is a yellowish, kind of a greenish color, so that's what this pale horse is looking like as it comes. And Hades and death come. Death is the physical cessation of life, right? Hades is the place of the departed dead. And you've got all of this, and a fourth of the world is killed. Keep that in mind. Now, it doesn't, I'm trying to picture, is it the whole earth and a quarter of the whole earth, or is it a more of a quarter part of the earth? I think it's the whole earth and a quarter part of it is what has died here during these first four. But they're similar seals, and it's interesting that in the, in the, uh, trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, the first four are generally similar, and the second three of each are different, and we'll see that. The fifth seal, fifth seal is now open. Verse 9, And I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. I'll stop right there. Now, one of the points for a post tribulation rapture, and we're not getting into that quite yet, but is the fact that he sees the souls, they're not resurrected bodies. If the church had been raptured already, there'd be believers in resurrected bodies. These are the, the souls. When we die, we go as soul and spirit to be with the Lord, right? Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To die, uh, you know, is gain, to live as Christ, die is gain. Uh, we go into his presence. The thief, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't have a resurrected body. He was there in spirit. So it seems like John is seeing these spirit souls on, of those who had been slain for the word of God. So there's persecution taking place. The, the Antichrist has come to power. There's battles taking place. Believers are being uh, martyred. Martus, witness, and it, it means martyred. It became to be known as killed because why? Witnesses were, for Christ were being killed. For the witness they had borne, and they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe, 
and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So the fifth seal is very different. John is seeing these martyred saints, souls, they're under the altar, and they are crying out, Lord, when are you going to bring vengeance? When are you going to avenge our death? And they're told, a little longer. Just wait a little longer because judgment is coming. And John is seeing that and recording that down. So we see f- famine, pestilence. We see some of the, uh, the things that are happening <clears throat> throughout. We've got martyrs throughout the, the world. We've got a variety of different publications. This is fascinating, uh, ranking the top 10 areas of persecution in the world for our fellow believers from North Korea down to Nigeria. I know Nigeria is, is gaining in that list and as greater persecution comes uh, on that. But you see where places of uh, where Christians are being martyred and more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries. And so persecution of our brothers and sisters, we don't truly experience that, right, unless we go to third world countries or we've, we've come from there. Uh, we're, we're somewhat sheltered here in America, but uh, to have a heart and passion for those who are being persecuted, uh, we see that. Continuing, says, then he opened the sixth seal. And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake And the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood. Do we ever see instances like that? John is seeing circumstances. He's experiencing earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, ash. Uh, We know that when that happens, the the properties of volcanoes, uh, some of you that are born to science understand that, but just the what's happening underneath the surface. We, a few years ago, we got to go to uh, Washington State and we went to Mount St. Helens and we saw what transpired in just moments when that immense earthquake took place and the devastation and the change of topography and all that took place on that. And, you know, with, with volcanic ash covering, you could have the sun blacked out like it's talking about. You could have the moon turning red. We do see that at, uh, at times as well. So the sixth seal, turn back to Matthew 24, if you would. And I, th- I think Jesus' words are really uh, very spot on as, as always. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Um, 15. So when you, uh, 29. Immediately after tribulation of those, that's that's it. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Jesus is giving the the apostles an understanding of what is taking place and John is seeing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure John is thinking, okay, 30 years ago, Jesus talked about this and I'm seeing it to a degree unfold here and I'm trying to record the best I can. So this, we're moving now the sixth seal and into that second three and a half years, it seems like, of the tribulation time. Verse 13, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. So you've got, this is just a rendition of something. This, what, this isn't an actual photo that Hubble took or anything like that. Uh, we'd be in bad shape, but a rendition of what something might look like. Uh, verse 14, the sky vanished like a scroll. Uh, reminds us, right, of it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. Uh, the sky will be rolled back like a scroll. The trump will resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. That picture taking place there. Vanished like a scroll was being rolled up. So I don't, you know, what is, this was recent. This is just a couple weeks ago. There was some new 
thing that uh, Hubble or somewhere found way out in the far galaxy, but just some kind of celestial explosion. But think about us, the scroll being rolled up. What, what is the sky actually doing? The sky, the, 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 the whole atmosphere is changing. God is bringing judgment on this earth. It is going to be uh, destroyed. God, Jesus is going to regenerate it for the millennium. And then at the end of the millennium, it's going to be totally dissolved and a new heaven, new earth with the new Jerusalem is coming. So a lot of things are going in the environment. So should we protect the environment? Yes. We should throw our litter away. We should be careful. But is it going to make a difference? It's not really, ultimately, God's going to do a lot more worse things <laughs> to the earth than, than we're doing. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones uh, rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So, so there's really a change in what the earth is looking like. And the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful. Look at those five categories. The great ones, the generals, the rich and the powerful. Uh, you know, and everyone. Slave and free. That's everybody else. That's all the common folk. Hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. Calling on the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? I, I wouldn't think with the, the mountains fleeing away and things catapulting unto the earth, being in the rocks wouldn't be a great place, but they would rather be there than face the wrath of God and the Lamb. And they're getting a sense that God's judgment is coming. So that is chapter 6. Any quick questions about that at all? Perfectly clear? <laughs> All right, let's keep rolling. Chapter 8. So chapter 7 will be at next week because there's a, an interlude. In all three cases, after the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, the sixth bowl, there's an interlude. And why is there an interlude? Well, maybe the Lord is giving extra time for people to repent. Maybe it's time for John just to try to take it all in and record the awesomeness of what's uh, going on. Uh, maybe it's just heaven getting ready for the anticipation of the Lord's return, a variety of things. Chapter 8, verse 1, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I, I totally resist the common joke of saying that that proves there's no women in heaven because there's silence in heaven. I, I won't say that, though. I, I won't say that one. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God. It's interesting, he said, what, the seven angels, not just any seven angels, the definite article. So there are seven hand-picked angels that the Lord had for this job, who stand before God, they're before his presence, ready for this role that they're going to play. And seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angels. Stop there. Go back to chapter 5 for a second, verse 8. Saw that last week. Said, and when he had taken the scroll, when Jesus the Lamb had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. If you ever get weary in praying, if you ever feel that it's not uh, uh, worth my while, just think that the, our prayers are considered sweet incense in the Lord's nostrils as he breathes that in. I, th I think that's really uh, very exciting. Verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, 
and an earthquake. So what we're going to see here, in kind of summary, the first four trumpets, we've seen the first one, really describe the destruction of the Earth's environment. We're going to see these four just really taking its toll on it. And the second three, which will be in chapters 9, 11, and 15, describe the devastation of the Earth's evildoers. There's judgment on the Earth. There's judgment on the Earth's evildoers. And we're seeing that beginning to lay out here. Verse 6, Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. There goes our nice new lawn. We got new sod coming in. We got sprinkler system, and it's not going to matter, right? It's a... We're burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. So you've got this idea of a volcano in the first one. This was, happened off of the island of Tonga just a couple weeks ago. And they said something like 100 times more powerful than the Hiroshima explosion. This was just a volcano there in the South Pacific. And now you've got things happening. The second angel blew his trumpet like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Is that an asteroid or something along a body uh, from outer space coming in? Down and, and a third of the sea became blood. Why? If it's killing creatures there, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Well, this is red tide. It's made from bacteria, but you can get a glimpse of what John might be experiencing there a little bit. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. Could it be a comet? Maybe. Fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers. This is the fresh water. The second angel, it was, it was falling on the salt water. This is the fresh water. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. Anybody know in literature what, who uses that? Who's that? C.S. Lewis, right? Screw tape? Screw tape's uh, lead angel for the guy he's tempting is wormwood, right? A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been bitter. Just stop there for a second. So you look on your notes, you can see a little bit of wormwood is mentioned in the Old Testament in, in Jeremiah, and it really means to curse, uh, poisonous, uh, cursed. Uh, we, we see it in Lamentations as well. So there's a a common thread here, but somehow the, the fresh water, so now people are dying because fresh water is being destroyed. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might, not, might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. What is that doing to the atmosphere? Well, it's changing things. I mean, we see eclipses, we see changes in the heavens, and obviously it's going to be changing just the whole uh, day-night scenario that we, that we know and we experience. When, when do we know a, a time when the sun was darkened like this? When was the sun darkened like this? When Jesus hung on the cross, right? There was supernatural darkness from noon till three o'clock as Jesus hung on that cross. Fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck through the, uh, verse 13. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe. Those are the last three trumpets, the three woes. We've had four of them. Those are the last three to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So it's just, it's interesting that several times eagles are used here. And of course, this is from the Lord of the Rings. It always seemed when Gandalf and Frodo and, and Bilbo had no way out, 
what happened? The giant eagles always came and they rescued him in the, in the Lord of the Rings and in The Hobbit. And I'm sure Tolkien was, was thinking about this, but these eagles are proclaiming uh, a judgment coming. Any quick questions on those first four of the trumpets at all? All right, let's keep going. Chapter nine, this is, uh, this is really quite a, quite a chapter. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key, he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. We'll stop right there. So verse one. So you've got some notes there, a star, a star. Uh, we get asteroid from that, a celestial body. Uh, so angels uh, are, are mentioned like that. Demons are mentioned like that. Christ is called the morning star. However, it seems to point to Satan, the devil, Lucifer. Go to Luke chapter 10 for a second. Luke 10. Jesus makes an interesting comment when the disciples come back after being sent out to do some mission work. Chapter 10, verse 17, the 72, so Jesus sent the 12 plus others out, return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's just a, a fascinating statement there. And then in Revelation 12, which we'll get to, uh, next week, we will see, it says Satan fell and, he, and he, his tail pulled a third of the stars of heaven. And we believe that's a third of the angelic hosts that were fallen became demons. And so there are myriads and myriads of angels. There's many, many demons uh, that are a part of this fallenness. So it seems like uh, the devil is given the key to go to this place pits. Well, what is this pit? It's not hell. It's a place where uh, demons, vile demons, have been held. Uh, back in Genesis, it talked about angels, demons cohabitating, right, with mankind. And God may have sent them into this pit. When you remember when Jesus was was approached by the man who was uh, possessed by a legion of demons, and he was going to send them out. What did they say? Don't send us to the pit. Send us into the swine. And he sent them out in the swine. They ran down the cliff. So there are demons in the pit. There are demons that are active now, right? They've fallen. They're, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Uh, they are... Uh, invisible, but they're operating, but there are demons that are in this pit. And Satan, it seems, is given, he was given it, so God under his sovereign care. Verse 2, he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, darkness, and, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. You just get this picture of darkness, abject darkness, where these uh, demons have, these foul demons have been. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth. Are they literal locusts? Well, John is trying to describe something, and if he's describing demons that God is allowing him to see, it seems to be he's describing them like locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or the green plant or any tree. That happened already, right, with the first angel uh, blowing the trumpet. But no, no more ecological destruction. This is destruction upon the evildoers. But only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were allowed to torment them for five months. There's a period of time here. So again, we're thinking we're into the final three and a half years and maybe getting closer to the final return of Jesus when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. 
So these demons are given permission to torment men, women, uh, those who have not put their faith in Christ. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like woman's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. Of course, we know Peter says what? Your adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their powers to hurt people for five months is in their tails. You know, and of course, we get speculations, well, these are, you know, Blackhawk helicopter type things, you know, and, and John is seeing all these advanced weaponry. Well, again, are we reading into it? But look at verse 11. They have as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. Now, it's interesting that in the book of Proverbs, it actually says that locusts have no king. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, the, the word of God actually says that. And as a result, um, it seems like these are demons. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, he is called Apollyon, the destroyer. Uh, the first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. So that's all that's happening in verses 1 through 12 in this chapter, verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. So the, the, there were horns on the altar, decorative horns. And in the Old Testament, what would happen? If you killed someone, you could go to a city of refuge and hold on to one of those, and you could be kept alive in that city. You couldn't venture out, but if you could stay there until the current high priest died, and then you had your freedom. There was a city of refuge. Well, uh, there's an altar like that. Uh, it says, Trumpet, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release thee, so specific four angels here, definite article, the four angels who are bound at the great U river Euphrates. So when you look at some of the notes there, and we can't really have time to, but the Euphrates River is uh, used throughout Scripture. The Euphrates River is one of the four rivers in the Garden of Eden. Now the flood came, so it's not the same Euphrates, but the Euphrates was there when the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, I mean, the Euphrates River is there. It plays a significant role and it, it really is right in the heart of the, in the Middle East there, and the demonic activity. I, a brief interlude here. I, was, I had just come to Christ the summer of 1973, before my freshman year in college, and I came home for Christmas when my family went to California. I, I had to go back, we were playing basketball, and so I had a quick break and I had to go back. So I was home, and my cousin Pete, who was a couple years older, were home for Christmas, and we went to see The Exorcist. <laughs> and uh, I, I've been a believer for six months now. And I came home, but the opening scene is, is in, kind of, if you remember back then, it, it's out in the air, desert area there, it, near Babylon, near the Euphrates River and all of that, just that sense of evil and foreboding. And just to finish the story, I, I came home and for the two more days I was home, I had every light on in the house, and I had every Bible that I had open. I, 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 was, I was so scared, and I was so glad to get back. And my family was enjoying themselves in California. And, but anyway, the, the Euphrates River, so the, the four angels who had been prepared, look how specific God is. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month and the year released to kill a third of mankind. It seems like these are, are demonic. They are bound. Regular angels, holy angels are not bound. These were bound and they go and destroy. And in your notes, 
you have uh, some descriptions of Old Testament passages that there are destroying angels and God has allowed demonic activity to accomplish his purpose in destruction. Verse uh, 16, the number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. That's where we get the 200 million. So troops, but it seems like these are just another listing of demons. I heard their number, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode with them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and sapphire and of silver, uh, sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire. Remember, just a short while ago, they were tormented, but now they are killed. And can demons do that? Yeah, demons can do that. They can, they can kill By these, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents. The others were like scorpions and heads. And by means of them, they wound. Stop there for a second. So we had, in the last chapter, a quarter of the earth was killed. And now we have a third. You add those two up, what, it's seven twelfths, more than half of the world's population has been killed during this time. The rest of mankind, verse 20, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the work of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood. That's what idols are, right? They're just man's creative way of trying to express who they think God is, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries. Sorceries is the Greek word pharmakia. We get pharmacy, but drugs, sorceries, drugs, or their sexual immorality. It's the Greek word porneia. We get pornography from that. Or, and it's interesting, their thefts. The thefts. How does how does that get put in there? You think, wow, well, you know, thievery. Well, that's that's lesser than these other ones. But when you think about it, when you when you break the Ten Commandments, when you have another god, you're really stealing from God, right? You're a thief from the worship that He desires. And when you don't worship in the true way, you're stealing from Him. When you use His name in vain, you're stealing His name. So thefts. Is very, is very appropriate there. So we finish chapter 9. Any quick questions about that at all? We're right on time. We're doing good. All right, let's go to chapter 11. Only five verses here. Beginning at verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet... And there were loud, there's that loudness again, loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Handel inspired from those lines, certainly. And it's, when you look at that, the kingdom of the world has become, has Jesus come back yet? He has not come back yet. A trumpet is blowing, but Jesus has not come back yet. But it's a sure thing. It is saying, we know he's coming. It is, it is absolute certainty. And that's why we can say the kingdom has become, even though he hasn't gotten there yet. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God, who we saw last week, fell on their faces. They, their worship is constant throughout on their faces and worship God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, and what are we missing? Who is to come. Why? He's coming. I mean, the seventh trumpet, and it's happening. I mean, the Lord is getting ready right now, and he is coming. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign, and the nations raged 
But your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for their rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and for those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So God is coming back in Christ to reward his people, those that are still alive, those that have gone before, and to punish those who have rejected him, who do not repent, even with all these signs happening. Verse 19, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. So there's a heavenly temple in which the earthly temples, and how many temples have there been? Well, there's, there was the Solomon's temple, right? And that was destroyed, and they rebuilt it. And then Herod uh, redid it, right? So that was the temple during Jesus' day, and the Romans came and destroyed that. There will be a temple rebuilt during this time. There'll be an earthly temple, and there'll be a, that'll head into the millennium time, and then there's no more temple because it says in the new heaven and earth, there's no need for a temple because God dwells among his people. He's right there. But we're not there yet. Chapter, chapter uh, 15. So we get to the seals here. Then I saw another sign in heaven... So signs, we talk about signs sometimes. We know all kinds of signs, right? Signs point us to somewhere to go. So this is a sign. John is used to signs. He talked about signs in his gospel. He, he recorded seven. You see your notes there, seven of Jesus' signs. Jesus turned water into wine, healed the official son, healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, he fed the 5,000, he walked on water, he healed a man born blind, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Those seven signs were to show that he was the Christ, the son of the living God, and that by believing we could have life in his name, as John summarized his gospel. Great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last for with them the wrath of God is finished. So this is going to come rapid fire, right? The seventh trumpet's blown. The Lord is ready to descend. So these final judgments are happening. Boom, 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 boom. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. So it's interesting, they're no longer under the altar, they're standing on this sea of glass. So the end is coming, the rewards of God's people are happening. When Jesus comes, he is going to descend with his saints in glorified body. That is the first resurrection, and we are going to reign with him on the earth. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, very similar to what we saw last week, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty, just and true are your ways. Stop there for a second. I mean, there is tremendous judgment taking place, isn't there? There is God's wrath, but it is just and it is true. God judges justly. Not out of revenge or anger. But he does it out of his pure justice for those who have rebelled against him. O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. That's why we take the gospel to the whole world. All nations will come. For your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven. So again, he's seeing uh, worship being taken place up there, and heaven was open. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest, very uh, uh, powerful angels that are coming. 
And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So it's more the bowl, as you see in that word uh, plague, uh, it's a, um, um, not, uh, not that one, but the, the, the bowl uh, word is really uh, referring to fillet, uh, a, a small dish like, so bowls that could be just poured over easily, not deep uh, bowls that we might think of, but these are gonna be just poured out very, very quickly based on the, the Greek word there. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God. And from his power, no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels was finished. And chapter 16, and now we'll see the bowls and I'll bring us to a close for tonight. Verse one, then I heard... John's been seeing a lot of things, but now he's hearing also a loud voice from the temple, temple in heaven, telling the seven, the seven angels, go and pour out, dump out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. We'll see that more next week when we look at the beast in more detail. And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. Every living thing, everything. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers, the fresh water and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard an angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, again, God's righteous judgments, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, if you have brought these judgments, for they who, they're the ones receiving the punishments, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets. Isn't what they were asking back several chapters ago, Lord, how long? How long before you come? And now the angel is saying, They've shed the blood of the saints and prophets. You're coming to bring them judgment. You have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, well, these are voices at the altar. Yes, Lord God, the almighty, true and just are your judgments. So a little interlude there. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. And they were scorched by the fierce heat. And they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, the Antichrist. And its kingdom, it's interesting, we'll see that next week. But when the beast is mentioned, it's it. It's not he, it's a man but he's referred to as it. And its kingdom was plunged into darkness and people gnawed their tongues in anguish. Hatred at God, hatred maybe of themselves for being in all this, gnawed their tongues in anguish, cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So what's happening? The the Antichrist has had his troops. There have been wars. He's tried to assemble all this. And now there's a group, and we'll see more of that next week, but there's armies coming across the Euphrates heading for Israel. Why are they heading there? Well, maybe to get supplies in Israel. If God superintended and protected Israel, maybe they're coming there. Maybe they're wanting to fight against believers who are there. Maybe they're wanting to fight against Christ. But they're coming. The river Euphrates is dried up. Its water is dried to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And I saw... 
coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, he's referred to the dragon, chapter 12, and out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, we'll see them in chapters 13, three unclean spirits like frogs. Frogs had demonic connotation in, the, in, in idol worship back in Egypt and, and in the Mesopotamia area. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle of the great day of God the Almighty. So these armies have been deceived and they are coming and in order for the armies to come to the final battleground, they have to cross through the Euphrates and God dries it up. And, be, and now look at this, just the grace of God one more time. Verse 15, Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Jesus one more time saying, Repent, turn to me. There, I can still save you. But man's heart is so hard that they're not even turning. But God is still extending it. And they assemble them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Napoleon said that the valley of Megiddo, north of Jerusalem, through Jerusalem and south, was the greatest battlefield he had ever seen. And many, many battles have taken place there in the Old Testament times and New Testament times. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city, what's the great city? Well, it's Jerusalem. The great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Chapters 17 and 18, we will see the destruction of religious Babylon and 18, destruction of economic Babylon. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found, God reshaping the whole topography of the earth. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So God has brought his wrath through seven seals and seven trumpets that lead to seven bowls and now it is finished and it reminds us when Jesus hung on the cross as his life was expiring what did he say it is finished the work of redemption is done now the work of his preparation of coming back his wrath upon a fallen world is finished. And so that leads us to maybe some takeaways and you know how do you how do you think through what are what are some of those? Well, I think one certainly through all of this we recognize God's sovereignty, right? He's in control. He's given the key to the pit. He's called the angels. He's given them the authority. He, God is running everything. Christ is in control. And so we can rest in that, can't we, in God's sovereignty and get to know that even better and better. You know, we can say that intellectually, right? Yeah, God's sovereign. But when you see it illustrated like this, to know God is really in control. He's really in control of your circumstances, mine, our lives. And it's a lot better for him to be in control than us to take control over, right? Second of all, I think we see 
just the, God's devastation and destruction. He is devastating, destroying the earth as a prelude to his regeneration. When Jesus returns, he is going to regenerate the earth for his millennial kingdom. And at the end of that, it's going to be dissolved, 2 Peter 3, and a total new creation, a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. So we see all that, and we, we know that God is active and working. Thirdly, I think just God's grace. God's grace that he gives man a preview of hell and calls man to repent. And he says, I don't want you in eternal hell. It's very bad, this judgment, but there's still time to repent and be saved and to spend eternity with me and not in the lake of fire. And that's just God's grace, all those interludes. And, and, and I think it's a call to us really to, you know, are we sharing the gospel? Do we know lost people? We do. You know, how do we, how do we best do? We love them, we care for them, we build relationships with them and look for opportunities to share the hope that's within us, right? Go to 1 Peter 3 for a second. I think that's a, a second. 1 Peter 3. I think Peter reminds us of that. Verse 15. Peter says, But in your hearts honor or sanctify Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Gentle. We're not trying to win an argument. We're not trying to argue people into the kingdom. Gentleness, respect. Here's the hope I have because of what Jesus has done in my life. And he offers that to you as well. And that's how we seek to share the love of Christ. Amanda, do you have some? Yeah, I tell you what, if we all were as diligent about inviting people as Amanda Taylor is of bringing people to church, she had two friends, she's got a, one of those friends is bringing a friend to the women's thing, uh, we, would, we would see far more life change. So keep up the good, I told you, keep up the good work there, man. And then lastly, I think uh, just a look at God's promises and protection. He has said throughout you know, he will protect his elect. He may rapture us before the tribulation. He may protect us through the tribulation and rapture us right as he's returning. But either way, he has said he will protect us and he's given us great promises as his people, his elect. And so we should rejoice in that. So we've got a few minutes at your table, uh, some questions just to visit about. Uh, and you obviously don't have time for all, but one question might be, how might we be seeing previews of these seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments? Again, a preview. Not necessarily the actual thing, but previews. What qualities of God stand out to you or impact you from the passage? And then is there one truth for you to take or one application to make from our time tonight? So you've got a few minutes. Visit with your table and... Share on some of those questions, okay? Go. Well, feel free to stay a little bit longer, but I want to honor your time and, and knock it off at 8 o'clock. Can I call on one of our elders, Ben O'Neill, to close us in a word of prayer and thank the Lord for our time tonight, Ben? Let's pray, friends. Uh, Father, thanks for the, just the, the truth of these passages tonight that... Um, hits you right in between the eyes with just a reality that is big and sobering. Um, and it could, Lord, produce fear and horror, but by the mercy of your Son, mm. it can produce peace Amen. and hope um, because of the gift of our knowledge of you, um, the, one, the one who redeems. And so 
Um, collectively, Father, tonight we, uh, we worship you. We worship you with uh, a steady heart that, that's willing to look these things squarely um, in the eye and, and honor the gravity of what you've written in this text. Um, so help us, Father, to not be paralyzed um, by the weight of it, um, but to be emboldened, as Dean said, to simply do the next right thing and, and communicate with, with passion and with hope to our family, uh, to our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, um, what we know to be true, that, that you are good and you are for us and you're in control. And you have a grand plan. So thanks for giving us a glimpse, God, of that plan. It really is just a dim glimpse, but you promise um, fullness. And, and, and tonight, even our, our vision has been enlivened. Our glimpse of who you are has grown bigger tonight, as Dean just said a second ago. And we're grateful for that. Um, go tonight, Father, with my brothers and sisters. If there's anybody here, Lord, um, who isn't yet walking in the security of your son, I just pray that you uh, come near to them this mm -hmm. week. Um, maybe they might be prompted to, to take a step of faith in you. Mm. Um, help God this church to be a place that honors you and, and all that we say and do. Forget, forgive us when we fall short of that. Um, and we love you, Lord. Um, and we commit this to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, man. Thanks, everybody. Great job tonight. And here, we got three weeks to go. Because uh, then break comes. So three weeks. Next week, chapters 7 through 16, the ones we didn't get to tonight, looking at different characters. Amanda's got the handout. Week 6 will be chapters 17, 18, and 19, the destruction of Babylon and the return of Christ. And then 20, 21, and 22, the, follow the last week. So that's where we're heading, Lord willing. <laughs>